Hey, everybody, and thank you to everybody who was able to join us in person, and hello to everybody on the live stream. Today, we're going to have a brief video that's part of a five-episode series on red tape. Today's will be on the case Sackets versus EPA. Following, we will have a discussion moderated by Morgan Brummond, kind of discussing different policy aspects uh, in that you will have seen in the movie. Um, this should be pretty quick. I believe it's about 12 to 15 minutes, and then we'll be moving into our panel discussion thereafter. For anyone here in person, feel free, especially after the film, to get up and get any refreshments. For those on the live stream, I'm very sorry they're not available from home. Um, but again, very grateful to everyone who came to join, and thank you so much for the, to the Federalist Society for your collaboration. Uh, those of us from American Conservation Coalition are extremely grateful because this event is not something that we could have done without this partnership. So thank you all, and we should be able to start. We hear a lot these days about federal agencies, the EPA, the FCC, the FDA, the USDA, and just about any other combination of letters you can think of. These agencies issue rules. As of a few years ago, there were about 185,000 pages of rules in something called the Code of Federal Regulations. These regulations raise a whole host of policy and legal questions. But agencies don't just issue regulations, they also enforce the law. And it turns out that enforcement raises almost as many difficult questions as issuing regulations does. Such as, at what point can Americans go to court to defend themselves against agency enforcement action? That's the question Mike and Chantel Sackett from Priest Lake, Idaho, took to court when the EPA attempted to fine them for building their home on top of what the EPA claimed was wetlands. The Sacketts had started the initial stages of their home construction, basically taking out the soil that was there, bringing in new soil that would be more appropriate for building a foundation for a home, more of a gravel base. And shortly thereafter, agents from the EPA and the Army Corps came unannounced onto the property and suggested to the Sackett's work crew who were doing work on the site that morning that they should probably stop doing what they're doing because in the opinion of these officials from EPA and the Corps, they were violating the Clean Water Act because they believed that there were wetlands on the property, that these wetlands were subject to federal regulation under the Clean Water Act, and that because the Sacketts hadn't obtained a permit to do any work in those wetlands, their home construction was illegal. We're talking about a piece of land near Priest Lake in North Idaho. The EPA says that land is federally protected wetland under the Clean Water Act, but the landowners disagree. Now Agencies carry out what the law says. Uh, so in this case, we have the Clean Water Act that's supposed to protect the waters of the United States from pollution and maintain water quality throughout the nation. Uh, but it doesn't enforce it by itself. Uh, it requires somebody to go there and do something about it. And so we have agencies, the Corps of Engineers and the uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, who are supposed to write regulations and then enforce those regulations by going out and finding people who are violating the regulations or violating the statute directly. So the government wants to take care of our country's waters, and they've asked EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers to do that. The wording of the Clean Water Act, though, is a bit vague and open to interpretation. Now the rub is, well, what is a regulated water? The text of the statute says navigable waters. And the question is, what does that mean? Which waters are covered by this? Is it my swimming pool? Uh, is it a puddle? Uh, is it an isolated wetland? Is it a wetland that's adjacent to a navigable water? What is it? And that's not clear under the statute. Wetlands are really important. Different kinds of wetlands serve different purposes in terms of mitigating flooding, where you cut off wetlands from tributaries and from streams, you get more flooding uh, because wetlands soak up that excess water uh, and keep it from flooding areas that we don't want to have flooded. It's also good in terms of being habitat for uh, various species. A very significant percentage of endangered species uh, live or have a critical uh, life functions in wetlands. So from the view of the EPA and the Corps, when the Sackett's construction crew, with their construction equipment, 
brought in the dump truck and dumped the, the clean sand and gravel onto the property to form the base for the foundation for the home, that that qualified as a discharge of a pollutant. And according to EPA and the Corps, the alleged wetlands on the property themselves qualify as, quote, navigable waters or waters of the United States because of alleged connections that the site has, arguably, to other traditional navigable waters. So EPA determined that the Sacketts started construction in their home on top of some wetlands. And they did so without seeking a permit. When the Sacketts refused to restore the area back to the way it was, the EPA issued a compliance order. And it says that the people uh, who don't comply with the compliance order uh, can be subject to a, a fine of $37,500 a day, uh, which is a lot of money. And so, uh, not just with this compliance order, but as you can imagine with compliance orders generally, they have a tremendous coercive effect because for the vast majority of Americans, seeing that sort of potential liability really produces no options. That for most people, the only option is to try and do exactly what the agency does, it's say that they should do, and to uh, comply and avoid any sort of catastrophic financial penalty. On top of the compliance order, the EPA refused to have any sort of hearing that would examine the facts of the dispute, leaving the Sacketts without a chance to explain why they thought the EPA was in the wrong. And so they say, well, we think you're wrong, EPA, and if you won't give us a hearing, we're going to go to court. And they do. They go to court, and they, they sue under the Administrative Procedure Act to try and get the, a court to say, look, EPA, this is not subject to your jurisdiction. It gets worse in the sense that after the Sacketts filed their lawsuit, EPA took the position that they didn't even have the right to file the lawsuit, that their compliance order was not uh, agency action that's subject to judicial review under the Administrative Procedure Act. And so not only did the Sacketts have no administrative recourse, but as far as EPA was concerned, they had no judicial recourse. They really had no recourse at all except to comply with the order. The Constitution guarantees everyone the right to due process, which includes the right to defend yourself in court against government action. So was EPA violating due process by telling the Sacketts they couldn't challenge its compliance order in court? The lower courts ruled against the Sacketts. The case did not go well for them at first. Uh, they lost in the district court, they lost in the Court of Appeals. In both cases, the, the, the courts said, well, you know, generally speaking, you can get judicial review of agency action, but the Administrative Procedure Act has an exception for laws where judicial review uh, is precluded by statute. And here, EPA had said, well, look, the Clean Water Act authorizes us either to go to court in order to get an injunction for somebody to do something, or to issue a compliance order avoiding court. And they said, because Congress provided these two different routes to enforcing the statute, they must have intended that the second route, the compliance order, wouldn't have to go to court to get judicial review. Yeah, we'd have to go to court to enforce the compliance order ultimately, but just once, just to enforce it that one time. And that must have been the intent of Congress. Their argument was that the compliance order was not a final action, even though on its face it represented what appeared to be a pretty clear adjudication that the Sacketts had violated the act and that they would be subject to significant penalties if they didn't immediately comply. But another part of their argument from EPA was that Congress couldn't possibly have intended to allow compliance orders to be reviewable because of these efficiency concerns. That if you allow anybody to seek review of a compliance order, it will hamstring the agency, it will be drawn into court, it won't be able to do the principal water quality and, and other tasks that Congress wanted it to do under the Clean Water Act. The Supreme Court ruled that the compliance order was final action by the government, and therefore could be reviewed in court. The Supreme Court's decision against EPA was unanimous. Well, Mike and Chantel Sackett have been tied up in court in a legal battle spanning across four different presidencies. This legal battle made its way to the Supreme Court back in 2012. And the again, decision was Monday. unanimous. Justice Scalia wrote the opinion. There were two significant concurring opinions by Justice Alito and Justice Ginsburg.
There's no question that uh, giving uh, people due process rights, giving them the opportunity to seek judicial review of agency action, those things are going to hamper, to some extent, an agency's ability to act. But I think rather than object to that obstructionism, I think we should celebrate it as a necessary acknowledgement of the rights of individuals, that even under today's administrative state, administrative efficiency is not the paramount good, that there are competing goods, and perhaps the most important competing good is the rights of individuals, their, their liberty interests, but also their property rights. I'm a pragmatist in the sense of uh, sometimes that's true. Sometimes the property rights uh, will be better than federal regulation, but uh, sometimes it's not. And in, with respect to wetlands, uh, I think history shows uh, that the uh, leaving it to property rights will not protect wetlands. Prior to the Clean Water Act, you know, two thirds, three quarters of all the wetlands in the United States were filled because it was economically more valuable to fill the wetlands than to protect them. So the individual property interest here in, in wetlands is rarely worth saving the wetland. It is almost always uh, to fill the wetlands, as it's in the case of the Sacketts themselves, right? Uh, even if the Sacketts wetland is not a jurisdictional wetland under the Clean Water Act, it just goes to show that filling that wetland uh, is, is the economic value of that property, not saving the wetland. After more than a decade, the Sacketts and the EPA finally appeared before the Supreme Court to decide the seemingly simple question, did they or did they not build on wetlands? The fact that they can even ask this question is a victory for the Sacketts, despite the many years it has taken to find the answer. The Supreme Court has again weakened the power of the Environmental Protection Agency. This time it involves wetlands. The court decided the agency's definition of wetlands was inconsistent. The ruling now says that Clean Water Act only applies to, quote, wetlands with a continuous surface connection to bodies of water that are waters of the United States in their own right, so that they are indistinguishable from those waters. Hi everyone. Um, I've met a lot of you here, but for those of you I don't know, my name is Morgan Brummond. I serve as the Government Affairs Director for ACC, and I just want to thank you all again for being here. Um, but a bigger thank you to our two environmental law experts here joining us today um, to shed some more light on the importance of the Sackett versus EPA case. So I want to introduce Darren Bax and Dr. William Busby. Um, thank you again. I'll ask for further introductions, but I will provide a brief one right now. Um, Darren is the director of the Center for Environment or for Energy and Environment, excuse me, and a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And Dr. Busby is a law professor at Georgetown University and an author whose recent publications have focused on climate regulation, deregulation, and federalism, amongst other topics. So we're going to begin this conversation with questions on the outcome of the case and um, then move into future impacts and next steps associated with it. So um, I'm going to pause in between those sections just so we can make sure there's quite if there are questions from the audiences, get those answered. Um, but if there are any clarifying questions, please feel free to interrupt um, during. Raise your hand, perhaps. We have a microphone that Alina can pass to you as well. Um, so I'm going to start by asking that both panelists just share a little bit more on your background as it relates to this case um, and environmental protection in general. And then um, perhaps share your takeaways from the film and include any additional context that you may not get from this film as well. Okay. Uh, thanks, Morgan. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, ACC and 
Fair Society. I um, appreciate it. Thank you, Professor Busby, as well. Uh, so, yeah, um, I guess you want to know my background and context. Well, I've worked on energy and environmental issues for, well, for a really long time. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Um, the WOTUS issue and this issue that we're talking about also for, for a while, more than a decade at least, in pretty much every facet from regulatory competence to the legisli legislative side of things to just events like this. So, yeah, this has definitely been a major issue that I've been working on, and it's this issue's been ongoing for decades, well, well before I even started working on it. So definitely been doing a lot of work on this issue. A um, couple of the takeaways. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So then we can start talking substance, maybe that, so. Sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, well first, thank you to everyone for hosting this, uh, and those who are here, and those who are here remotely. Um, so I'm Bill Busman, I'm the Georgetown Law faculty, um, and so there I teach environmental law courses, and before that I taught environmental law courses at Emory University, and I've also done teaching stints at Cornell, and Columbia, and Illinois, and abroad as well. Um, but I also am someone who practiced as a lawyer, uh, and I worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council, I clerked for a federal judge, uh, and then I also worked for a big corporate law firm, or medium-sized corporate law firm in New York, where I did land use and environmental work, much of which involved issues of land use and sometimes uh, what, when uh, construction was restricted due to the Clean Water Act. Um, in connection with this, like Darren, I've worked on waters issues for a while, so um, the issue that we're talking about is the more recent case, which is what is a regulated water of the United States, which is the definitional language from the Clean Water Act. And uh, on that, going back to 2005, I represented before the Supreme Court a bipartisan group of former EPA administrators who were arguing for retention of, at that point, uh, 30 years of consistent policy of Republican and Democratic administrations about what should be protected um, that resulted in a case called Rapanos, um, and then subsequent to that, as of there, and then there was regulatory activity and legislative activity, uh, and on those fronts testified before House and Senate committees on different points uh, to talk to people about possible legislative fixes because the Rapanos left some confusion, and then in the Sackett case, the one, the, there were two Sackett cases at the Supreme Court, this most recent one, um, I, I led a brief for 167 members of Congress that talked about why should we retain the protections uh, long, at this point, 45 years of consistent political policy about when and how you protect uh, federal waters of the U.S. And so we can talk about substance. So I've been living and breathing this for a long time, as have been people all across the political spectrum. And I will say one interesting twist about this, since this is your conservation coalition and the Federalist Society is groups on wetlands split, okay? That is, so a lot of hunting and fishing groups have often argued for protection of wetlands and have, uh, in the Rapanos case, wrote a pretty powerful brief for retaining the protections. Um, and so this is an area where, you know, protecting of waters for their use for agriculture, for recreation, hunting and fishing is big business. And so there can be people with business interests who are, favor protections, and then other people who want to have a little freer reign to uh, develop and fill property, and that's kind of what we'll talk about. So we'll go to substance, but that's my background. So why don't you go ahead and give your spin yeah. on the case. So. I'll, I'll, yeah, a couple of takeaways related to the video itself. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about is the discharge of a pollutant. I think there's this kind of idea that when we deal with discharge of a pollutant, we're talking about like, dumping toxic waste in pristine waters. Well, that's not really what's being discussed here in the Sackett context. And in many instances, we're dealing with dredge and fill permits. So it's really dirt moving activities, somebody just trying to build a house. So the Sacketts weren't trying to like, you know, dump toxic waste on that land or anything like that. Um, and then, you know, it's just some strange language with the Clean Water Act works is that in a technical sense, a very hyper-technical sense. In theory, you could kick sand and, and water, and somebody might say you need a permit. Um, the, I mean, I'm not saying practically, but the bigger issue, and I think the big theme 
from the video is there's kind of a Kafka-esque aspect to the Clean Water Act and the compliance. Like you just kind of expect, the, don't expect the government to kind of knock on your door and then find out that you violated something you never expected that you violated, you don't even know what the charges are type of thing. Um, and, and the issue is not simply as a property owner that you're not sure whether or not the regulation applies. For many property owners, you don't even know that there's a regulation would even come into play at, at all. So it does come as a surprise for Sackets and many other property owners. Um, the issue is that the, the agency definition of what's the regulated waters is so vague and subjective and has been. A lot of the language, like they'll come up with like terminology and then they'll have like a catch-all category or it'll be fact specific. So the agencies will determine whether or not is a water is regulated on a case-by-case -case basis. So in Rapanos, the, the court, so that was the 2006 case, they cited a government, well, it was the General Accountability, Accounting Office, but GAO report, and, and basically laying out the fact that the, the core was intentionally using these vague definitions. And, and why would they do that? They, they do that because they don't want to put themselves in a corner. Um, and they want to have the flexibility to basically decide on a case-by-case -case basis that something actually is a regulated water. Um, and let's see. The other point is the confusion doesn't just affect property owners. It affects the agencies themselves. You know, they don't know what actually is waters in the United States, what's covered. And so you could have two experts from the same agency looking at a water, and then they would have different outcomes as to whether or not something is regulated. So you, you get into some serious problems. And one problem you get into is if you, if something is so vague, you get into potential problems with sorry, um, the void for vagueness doctrine in the Constitution. So something like, if you don't know whether or not even how to comply or something is a violation, it can have constitutional implications. And you should bear in mind, even though it was just mentioned civil enforcement, there's also criminal enforcement of the Clean Water Act. Um, so my last point is because I know that your question asked about some additional context. So one thing is the Sackett case, as was mentioned in the video, this, that's Sackett 1 we'll refer to, is, was a unanimous decision. Sackett 2, which we're going to kind of talk about and we're kind of talking about already, which looks at the question of what waters are regulated, was also a unanimous decision as it relates to whether or not the Sackett's property was a wetland and should be regulated. Um, so that's, I think, really important. Also, this is the third time in the last 22 years that the Supreme Court has struck down the EPA or the Corps for their overreach when it comes to the Clean Water Act. So it's pretty special in, in some ways because it's pretty hard to get struck down the Supreme Court three times when the Court gives so much deference to agencies. But this is now the third time. So, so I'll leave it there. Um, so I'll fill in a couple of things. So, um, so I gather that the the audience here, a lot of people may be undergraduate students. Is that correct? Is that, and then, or we don't know. I think a mix of students, but also young professionals. Okay, and so then not sure on the live stream. Okay, so uh, if anyone, but uh, so uh, well, I guess a few things that. So one is the the video and describing the chronology. If the record presented by the government and not disputed before the recent Supreme Court, it's slightly different in the Sackett case in ways that maybe change the narrative here that's worth talking about. So um, when the Sacketts first were thinking of uh, developing this property for a home, um, the first thing they would do, as would all property owners, would be figure out the status of the land. This was, area was mapped as a wetland. So if you looked at public documents, it was part of a wetlands complex. Not being sure if that was correct, they did what also other businesses, because this is also part, they were business in the business of building home, but this was a home they intended for themselves. Um, they went to a consultant, said, tell us what you think. Their own consultant looked at the property, which was very wet, and, and said, uh, under uh, regulations as they stood in case law, said, no, this is a wetland. So their own consultant told them it was a wetland. and. They wanted to proceed when they started to proceed, despite the mapping 
and what their own expert said, that's when the federal officials came in. So this was not a, the, the actual facts of this case, this was not something where they were surprised they might be in the crosshairs of regulation. They were told it was, and it was mapped as a wetland. Now, that's not to say they couldn't, as citizens, push to modify the law, and that's what they did. You know, so they were working with the Pacific Legal Foundation, which is a property rights focus group, and so this is really a campaign that many groups have been part of to weaken the Clean Water Act and heighten the ability of uh, mostly home builders, but also some agricultural interests to have less protected by the Clean Water Act. So, so, so that's part of the case. Now, the um, and this is getting putting on my professor hats. You may think like, how do we decide this? Okay, so one of the parts of of this case that. Um, people learn in law school and political science and maybe junior high school civics um, has to do with separation of powers. Different branches make different choices. So the major choices here are not made by the courts or by me or by Darren or by the lawyers for the Sacketts, but are ultimately made by Congress. And so the big question in this case was, what was protected uh, by Congress in the Clean Water Act here? What did it mean to protect for wet waters of the United States? Uh, and the Supreme Court, actually, in the recent Sackett case, narrowed it and said, okay, what should the test be for wetlands under waters of the U.S.? Importantly, it's not just a case about wetlands, okay? Industrial polluters are regulated when their pipes discharge uh, only if they are discharging into a water of the United States, okay? Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, in the Sackett case, uh, this is kind of what the decision, we didn't really get much in the uh, video. The Supreme Court in this case uh, adopted a view requiring that for something to be jurisdictional, it has to basically have relatively permanent, continuously flowing, permanently connected uh, wetlands or uh, tributaries and the rest to what are called navigable and fact waters, larger waters like oceans, bigger rivers. Um, and so now you may think, great. The big question is, was that policy that articulated by Justice Alito speaking for the Supreme Court, was that consistent with what Congress set forth in the Clean Water Act? Um, my view and the view of, of many, but not everyone, <laughs> is that, so you know, some people may love the outcome but think the case is a terrible decision. Um, and that part of that is the following. The, the statute itself says it protects adjacent wetlands. It actually says, why do you protect waters and wetlands in particular for habitat reasons, fisheries functions, and the rest? So it's not just about ships. And in, the most, in this Sackett 2 decision, the court very heavily emphasized the, uh, the importance of navigability in the sense of connection to larger bodies of waters used by ships. And to get there, it actually did not look or quote or grapple with all of the contrary parts of the statute. So, so for all of you who are wondering, the reason this is a separation of powers battle is, you know, does Congress make the choices? What can agencies do? But also, what can judges do in recasting laws? And so many people think that the majority opinion um, recast the law in ways inconsistent with what the Clean Water Act said. We can talk about the effects of it, which I hope we'll get to, but that's where a lot of the debate is. Did the court get there in a sound way, respectful of what Congress enacted into law? So I, I, I try to peel off about... Um, Pacific Legal Foundation. Yeah, Pacific Legal <laughs> Foundation. Um, about the kind of the timeline. Mm -hmm. And there was a JD a jurisdictional determination kind of deciding that, um, that, that the land might have wetlands. But that was before Rapanos, a couple of major cases. And they weren't aware of that determination. And that the EPA, they only hired the consultant after the EPA had come to the property. That's what I've been told by that. I'm, I, um, that that's, that, unfortunately, I didn't bring the briefs, but anyone who's curious that when the United States files a brief for the Supreme Court, it will refer to the record, and there has to be a certified record. So the record actually can lay out the chronology. I, I, I thought it was different, but that's something that people. So the about. on the look, the waters of the United States language doesn't just come out of the blue. There is a history of it, and it is kind of grounded in. I won't 
get into too much detail, but it is grounded on the idea that we're dealing with traditional navigable waters, which are usually waters that are used or susceptible to use in commerce. And everything that kind of, that's, that's where Congress gets its power is through the Commerce Clause and using and looking at those waters. And then the reason why we're looking at tributaries connected to those waters is because, well, they're connected to those waters. And how do you know whether or not something is a regulated water? Well, just the, the, the nature of what the court had said in Rapanos and even before is we're looking at relatively, exactly what the professor said, we're talking about relatively permanent waters. Um, basically, waters that you would think of in ordinary parlance are lakes, streams, oceans, or rivers. So it seems to kind of make sense. Like when we're talking about waters in the United States, we should actually be thinking about water bodies, not just some little trickle that happens a couple of days of the year or a puddle, and that we're actually dealing with actual water bodies. Now, when I'm writing about this issue, sometimes I get editors that complain that I always use the terminology like waters as opposed to water bodies. And the reason why I do that is because you can't call some of these things water bodies by what the agencies are trying to regulate. Many times they're trying to regulate things that, for the most part, most of us would think of as dry land or small depressions in land that might hold water a few days of the year, a piece of precipitation, and then it's kind of a ephemeral water, and therefore that's something that they would consider to be a water of the United States and therefore should be regulated. So that kind of goes overboard. So the court is trying to address some of the vagueness issues that have long existed and make it possible so that this law can actually be enforced in practice. And then just one thing on the statutory component. The court did mention the added provision in 1977 about adjacent wetlands. But that provision was not added to the definition section of what Waters of the United States is, or navigable waters. It's, so what the court said in this latest case, the Sackett case, was if the court, if, if the Congress wanted to in fact change the definition of Waters of the United States and what's actually regulated, then they would just basically go into the definition section and make that change. Instead, this provision is kind of a secondary type of provision and adjacent means, all the court was saying was that adjacent means that's adjoining, that's a continuous surface water connection. So there are adjacent wetlands, but they have to be connected to the actual water of, uh, water of the United States, something that's a water of the United States independent of anything else, as opposed to what the EPA wanted to do, which was, well, adjacent means neighboring and these other factors. And this is, imp this is important because if you start getting to neighboring and, and other f issues, then you can kind of cover all kinds of things that nobody can ever envision. So uh, on that, this is getting, getting in the weeds about water. So, um, so, but, uh, so just one interesting twist for those who are trying to kind of understand how law works. You know, the choices Congress puts in statutes are deeply contested. And so one of the important uh, <laughs> insights uh, of past uh, former Justice Scalia was that we respect the bargains in each statute. And so in the Clean Water Act, there are portions of the statute that talk about adjoining. And then there is, in this particular provision, the language of adjacent. And so one of the interesting splits in the Sackett case was Justice Kavanaugh disagreed with the majority, as did uh, several um, people who dissented in the reasoning but joined the judgment. Um, and said that what the majority was doing was really swapping in language that was not in the statute. Um, and you know, th there is a big difference to be, the statute says adjacent, and, and the current Supreme Court is uh, filled with ju justices who describe themselves as textualists. So you would look to see what does adjacent mean? What is its ordinary meaning? And then you look at dictionaries, and an ordinary meaning of adjacent includes neighboring, okay, and nearby. Adjoining, it, it requires a more of a direct connection. So the view of Justice Kavanaugh and those dissenting from the reasoning of the majority uh, was that the court effectively swapped in different language than Congress had actually chosen. But I do want to change the subject a little bit because I'd be curious to hear your view. So one of the big parts of the decision that's interesting and, and is um, for those who are interested in regulation or excessive regulation is the um, 
the majority opinion written by Justice Alito goes on for about a, several pages about the difficulty and demanding nature and costliness uh, and science, uh, difficult questions of science of regulating via permit. Uh, now this is, in fact, what Section 404 of the Clean Water Act does and what Congress chose. And so an interesting question, just again on separation of powers, if Congress chooses to have a science-based permitting regime, should the Supreme Court narrow the reach of a statute because of what Congress expressly chose? Normally, Supreme Court doctrine going back, uh, most famously endorsed by Justice Scalia in some earlier major cases called Heckler versus Cheney and Vermont Yankee, is that the political branches choose procedures and the court should not reassess how procedures should work. So one of the problems with this case from the view of critics is the court uses its dislike of a permit-based regime and the use of science to call for narrowing of the statute, but it is actually expressly what the statute sets forth as its regulatory strategy. So it's an interesting twist in the case. So real quick, on the adjoining neighboring thing, the definitions also include adjoining too as well. So it has neighboring. So the question is, do you take the outer, the most extreme definition, or you take the less extreme? And you, again, you don't, this provision is like this little provision in a section that's not the actual definition section of it. And you're trying to take this one little provision and try to define all waters in the United States in the section that actually, where it actually is defined. So it's, it seems like you're, it's, you're overstating the importance of that provision. Um, the, the court is concerned about vagueness issues. The Clean Water Act, right at the outset, is makes it clear that the primary role of um, for water pollution and addressing water pollution is the states have the primary role. In fact, Congress is supposed to preserve that role. So the the court is taking that into account. There's a clear statement rule um, that the court brought up in Burpano's hand here that when the federal government is trying to, or federal agencies are trying to intrude on traditional authority of state and local governments like land and water use, <clears throat> you have to have a clear statement of congressional authority. So that if you're trying to regulate so many waters that are usually in the purview of state and local governments, then you need to have some type of clear statement of authority to do so. So there's so many factors that go into it, but realistically just trying to come up with a workable way of defining the law, otherwise we're gonna, when you get to substantial nexus, we probably don't want to, but the moral of the story is it's so vague that if you don't create some clarity, the law is just not going to work anyway, and it hasn't. Well, thank you both. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, uh, we gonna agree. I'm going to jump <laughs> in. I'm going to jump back in here, but I think that you you pretty much covered the, the next question I had, so I'm going to actually move on to um, just a question, a more general question. So um, supporters of this decision argue that it'll help wetland conservation um, because it will empower private landowners to engage in voluntary wetland conservation um, without fear of penalization. Um, so opponents feel that limiting the EPA's power will hinder the agency's ability to enforce the Clean Water Act and protect wetlands. And just broadly curious, um, do you feel like it's helping or hindering wetland conservation one way or the other? Um, would love to hear both of your thoughts. So Feel free first, to. So you there you go. Okay, so I'll go first this time. So, um, well, so first, importantly, this decision is not just about wetlands. It has to do also with the regulation of an industrial pollution out of pipes from large factories. And so, right now, for example, as a result of Sackett 2, if you, I was just part of a, an, another panel discussing this case, and uh, a regulator from a arid western state, southwestern state said what percentage, uh, was asked, what percentage of previously protected waters in your state are now lost from protection uh, in the state? 98% were lost. So 98% of previously protected water features, I'll call them, are no longer federally protected. And industrial polluters have started to say, so now can we pollute without a permit directly into what in some cases in arid states are river features that are only flowing some of the year. 
And the answer there, it depends on state law, it depends on another statute called RICRA, which has to do with land disposal or solid waste disposal. And you, I'm sorry, would you mind giving an example of like a body of water that is no longer regulated based on the definition now? Yes. Um, most of, so there's two big things that have been lost. So anyone from the southeast where you have rivers that are cut off by levees, um, so a lot of previously protected waters that are behind levees may now be lost. Um, that was raised before the Supreme Court and it did not carve something out. So, so there's a big question about areas where there may be a lot of water, but they're no longer directly connected. Okay, so that's one issue. And then, then the rest is actually almost the entire west and southwest of the United States. Areas that have intermittently flowing water features and wetlands that dry out part of the year, which they do, um, are, it appears, no longer protected. So, and this is where it gets interesting as far as where should property rights oriented advocates be. If you are the owner of property where you bought the property because you wanted to be near a protected water feature, your property has just lost massive value. If you are a recreational outfitter in a business of having people going using wetlands and they're lost from protection, they may be lost from protection. And so there too, your business has just taken a hit. The big benefit here is like National Association of Home, businesses that want to do new building and probably large scale agricultural businesses that don't want to have to worry about filling and dumping, um, they are benefited in a big way. But I think actually at the scale of individual property owners in the entire West and Southwest, this case probably has devastated uh, the value of many, many property owners uh, in ways that I'm not sure the majority of Justice Alito knew when writing for the court. Um, but that 98% figure, that's, that's major. Now as far as volunt uh, owners can always decide to protect their wetlands if they want. Okay, uh, and so that's always the case. So the curious thing now is many states have taken over federal protections of water pollution from industrial discharge, sometimes wetlands, and then they have their own state laws. Okay, so and then there's land use restriction. And so the big question now is what will state and local governments do where they now, if they want, they no longer have to be protective because the Supreme Court no longer says that's federally required. Um, so I don't see any way this creates heightened incentives for wetlands protection by private property owners, but now the big question is what will the state and local governments do? So I, I, I'm not gonna get into the significant nexus test in any detail, but um, that was the standard that, that the Justice Kennedy came up with some type of test in a case called Rapanos, and it's been relied upon by the EPA and, and the Corps in the past and including in the recent Biden administration rule. And it's just a very vague, unworkable, very broad test. And as the court points out, and I'll just use the language they have, by the EPA's own admission, almost all wetlands, all, almost all waters and, wet, and wetlands are potentially susceptible to regulation under the significant nexus test. So pretty much everything potentially could be regulated. So. One of the questions is, what is the, the, where are we starting from in terms of the baseline? Like, one of the problems is we're not even clear what waters have been, even been regulated. So it's hard to know how many more waters are regulated now or less waters are regulated because we're not even sure what was actually properly regulated in the first place. So if it was based on the Cinematic Nexus test, <clears throat> well then yeah, then you're gonna have fewer waters regulated because as EPA's own, only if they admit in the rule, it pretty much would cover almost anything. So on the question of helping and, and hurting, um, so I'll just assume I'm comparing the, what I think is a proper interpretation of post-Sackett of what's covered versus the more expansive agency type of interpretation. Um, look, it, it provides clarity to property owners, so that helps. But it also, what I think helps, for what it's worth, is I think it helps agencies to Start spring their wheels on worrying about what's regulated and what's not, and use their time and resources better on actual genuine issues that we're not going crazy over something that's actually a water. And you're not looking at aerial photographs to figure out whether or not something is a water of the United States. So you can just use your resources better. Will it hurt? Um, it will hurt 
in the sense that the federal government will not be able to regulate <coughs> as many waters as these EPA and Corps have wanted to regulate for so long, but I don't think that's a bad thing, I think that's a good thing. Um, and I think it's important to not think that the only way to address these issues is through federal regulation. The federal government itself has all kinds of programs to address wetlands conservation, Spe lots of spending. There's all kinds of conservation programs spending billions of dollars. And then of course there's, that's just the federal government, forgetting just the regulatory angle. Then there's states and local governments that can step in where they think it's actually needed, um, and they will. And they will more so now than they have because the federal governments have kind of heavy-handed approach won't be as heavy-handed, and there will be pressure on the local level, and then of course there's property owners, so I'll leave it there. So um, I just wanted to add uh, two things, and then go to whatever questions yeah. you'd like. So, so importantly, for anyone, especially those in the audience who are interested in law, what a great thing to study, yeah. or environmental protection, and that's probably why you're here, or regulation, whether it's good or bad, and private property. So. Actually, I, we're, I have a pretty strong disagreement with Darren just said. So if, if someone wants to, had a question about what they could develop, there is ex, the, the Damien Schiff in the, in the video says there's whatever, thousands and thousands of pages of regulations. And it's true, okay? There are a lot of regulations. There are a lot of explanations of regulations. There are guidance documents. There are past permit decisions. There's a lot of law that people can research to find out what is required? When is a wetland protected? When is it not protected? The law is actually, it's very science intensive, so it's never been easy. And that, in that respect, the Supreme Court gets it right. This is not necessarily easy. But to say something is difficult and science intensive is not to say unknowable. And so the law has long until this case, it was very, people would be asked questions all the time as lawyers. Can, do you think I can develop here or not? You would look at regulations that carved out small pieces of property. There's a question, okay, if something is a connected wetland or tributary that's uh, blocked just because of a human-created berm, it's still regulated. That's what the regulations have said. Uh, there are certain tests for how wet the site is, looking at the features. This is all findable. So all you ACE researchers, when you get out there, there's a lot of law. This is not an area where there's lack of guidance. There's a lot of law and then science you can apply to it. So, so again, the people have to distinguish between something that may be difficult and something that's unknowable. If you wanna go into tax law, tax law is difficult, okay? If you wanna do securities regulation, you're gonna to have to hire securities lawyers. If you wanna build in a way or run a business that could run afoul of the environmental laws, you have to do the research and invest and figure out what the rights are. It's how law works in complex, difficult areas that matter to all of us. But so difficulty and unknowability are very different things. And so that's where I think you and I have a disagreement. Hey, just 10 seconds. Just to me, okay, if, you're, if you're building a house in a subdivision where other people built a house on property that doesn't look like anything that's Got any water or anything? Uh, you not sometimes you won't even think about the possibility. Uh, you would need to actually look into the issue. Or if you're a farmer and you're plowing your land, you're never going to think that there might be a potential issue just because you plowed your land. So there's there's all kinds of horror stories there too. So that's the problem. But I agree, tax law is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to move into the latter half of my questions, but I do want to pause and just make sure there's no questions from the audience because would love to pass you the mic if you do have any. Please feel free. For those in video land, there's thousands of people here. Just <laughs> that's just a clamoring group of people. You just can't see them because they're they're behind the camera. Okay. So. Alina, do you want to? Yeah, so I have a quick question. Um, this might not even be within the scope of the case or uh, uh, the act itself, but I was wondering whether both of you could speak to how uh, groundwater and seepage and aquifers factor into uh, the consideration of whether or not an area is a wetland. Um, I can give a short, a very short answer, and Darren maybe can fill it in more, but the bottom line is, 
there was some question whether um, shallow subsurface flows could be part of considerations whether something is protected. Uh, and so there were tests people were doing with dyes and sometimes tiny little things to figure out if what might disappear beneath the land but comes right back out if it really is a contigu uh, contiguous, continuous water feature. Um, as far as groundwater itself, the Clean Water Act has not, that has not been the focus of the Clean Water Act. So there's separate bodies of law. A lot of it, uh, there's been a whole recent big series in the New York Times about groundwater and it's being used up heavily in areas of water scarcity. And so the reason that can happen is it's an area that kind of falls between the cracks a little bit. And frankly, like a lot of environmental resources, people didn't focus on it. When groundwater seemed abundant, then people didn't really view it as a need for environmental regulation. Now some groundwater in certain areas because of both climate change and heavy use, in some cases fracking, uh, is becoming scarce. So, um, so that's part of it. There's a, for those who are on the science side, there's a thing called the connectivity report that uh, EPA and the Army Corps pulled together between the Rapanos case um, and Sackett where they surveyed the functions of different types of waters and some of that report, which it's actually a, a, a distillation of the best peer-reviewed science, and I've never heard anyone criticize it as anything other than that. It gets some into this issue about when might you protect uh, subsurface water, but this isn't deep groundwater. This would be usually shallower flows. Um, well, first off, thank you both for coming to speak with us. Um, very interesting case. Um, I guess we talked a little bit earlier, Darren talked earlier about uh, uh, catch-all terms that were particularly news that gave the agencies flexibility in how they wanted to enforce things, which of course can maybe lead to selective enforcement. I guess for me, just prima facie looking at this case, it seems very terrifying that, you know, maybe this case was different as far as they had some indication that there was water on the ground and that this was a wetland ahead of time. But, you know, hearing it on the news and things like that, it sounds very scary, the idea that, you know, the EPA could come after you for something you might not know about. Um, and I'm wondering if in the law there's any sort of uh, considerations for size and scope, right? An individual house will have an impact, but nowhere near the scale of, say, you know, building a casino on a, in brackish water rates or something like that. Um, is there any sort of indication that, like, the EPA has just sort of had this mindset that all water is good water? And, or that, like, like, you know, we, it doesn't matter if it's a house, it doesn't matter if it's a casino, it all should be protected. Or is there, I, I guess what I'm saying is, like, it sounds like from a provincial standpoint that the area that would be most, you'd want to start with the biggest, most impactful instances first, and that something like this would be a relatively small fish that would not merit the level of uh, focus, the amount of time, the amount of effort to really try to, this should not be a major concern, at least not to the same extent if there are much bigger things going on in this country that we want to protect. Either of you can respond to this. That's a good point. I, go first. I don't, one thing I have thought about, and I'm not sure, um, probably do some, need to do some more thinking, is there's something to be said about distinguishing between 404 treasure fill permits and actually kind of 402 kind of like permits where you actually are dumping in some type of actual problematic stuff into the water. Um, maybe there should be different types of standards that apply. Um, the, my point about <clears throat> helping the agencies kind of gets to the point you're kind of making is that the agencies then would be able to focus on the more important things that are a little bit more clear cut also. So. That's kind of my take on that. Yeah. Um, two things. One is um, the Clean Water Act and regulations that have a whole bunch of carve outs. So, yeah. so a lot of agriculture types of uses are excluded uh, via regulations. There have been other exclusions and carve outs and clarifications. And to your particular question, small parcels, there are actually a thing called general or nationwide permits that create a presumptive right to permits um, without blocking uh, the project. That is, to say you're obliged to get a permit does not mean you can't get the permit. Many often you can for small scale development. So, between the the exclusions and the nationwide or general permits, as they're called, um, smaller scale developments under certain acreage often is either not regulated at all, 
or is subject to this more streamlined permitting process. But there's also just an additional point that you need to think about. Most environmental ills are death by a thousand cuts. That is, you know, a single polluter polluting in the Hudson has no effect, okay? 10 polluters in the Hudson has a larger effect. If you have 10,000, then you really make the difference. It's the same thing actually with wetlands. So if individual property, real estate development is the, probably the, that, and I think agriculture is the main disruptor of land use in this country. And so if you automatically said home development was excluded, then you could have the aggregate effects of many small things cause devastation environmentally. So that's often, it's, it's one of the challenging, interesting parts of the area Darren and I both work in is, you know, everyone has an interest in making sure you don't despoil something. You know, we wanna walk out of here in lovely Washington DC video viewers and, uh, and not suffocate from pollution, right? And so you have to regulate smaller sources to make sure you protect the uh, aggregate interests. And so that's why it's a difficult question. But bottom line is there is this streamlined permitting under this nationwide process, which is the main answer. Anyone else? Um, thank you guys so much for coming out here. This has been really awesome to listen to both of your um, thoughts and opinions on this. Um, my question is just about, um, y you know, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of talk about science here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I'm, not, I'm not a science person, um, so I, I, I guess I don't really know. But I, I'm just curious to know if you could, could maybe touch on what the science behind building a home would be and kind of the, the, the correlation here with that you said um, death by a million cuts. And so, you know, what, what, what kind of um, science-based, uh, fact-based um, environmental harm can come from uh, maybe like 100 people building homes on, on wetlands? Um, do you want me to go first? So, then, you can, then you can tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so the, the bottom line is wetlands are valuable as the, in the clip uh, Professor Funk kind of laid these out. But the bottom line is wetlands are valuable very often for functions that we barely see. So, they, so one is many fish and waterfowl and amphibians make heavy use of wetlands. And so any building in wetlands of whatever type can cause devastation to that functionality of wetlands. So people, that's part of the reason hunting and fishing groups have called for protection of wetlands and long have been on the environmental side on this issue, uh, is that if you allow people to fill in wetlands, then you destroy the resource that allows fisheries, for example, to flourish. Um, the other is, uh, the other two things uh, is that there's, in times of severe storm events, as we've seen are happening more and more frequently, um, wetlands have both they filter pollutants, so they are incredibly effective, more effective than any technology at literally filtering pollutants, but they also dampen and absorb water. So major storm events, when you have a buffer of wetlands, major storm events tend to be far less harmful to real property owners and, and local governments um, and require far less spending by insurance industry and the like because wetlands have this protective function. Uh, and so, um, and then again, it's important to keep in mind this decision also has unprotected industrial dischargers into previous, previously regulated water features. And so uh, depending on what happens, there will be more just direct pollution of toxics and the rest that previously was prohibited that now may be allowed. And, and part of the reason there's an interesting twist here, which you shall be aware of. Some states have laws that prohibit states from being more protective than federal law. And so a big question now is what's going to happen in some of those jurisdictions if federal law has ramped back, then what happens with the state law? Does it automatically ramp back? Do they have to pass new laws? But there is uh, this feature, I don't know, maybe a few dozen states, I think, have uh, these laws. And this is a, another interesting twist. I'm not disagreeing with any of the science, um, but the Supreme Court is analyzing legal issues, interpreting a statute, figuring out the congressional power as to what Congress can regulate in the first place, balancing those interests with congressional, congressional intent to make, to respect the state role in addressing water pollution. These are legal questions. Science doesn't give us an answer to those legal questions. Um, there might be some issues on the margins where the science can inform, 
sort of things, but whether or not a traditional, a traditional navigable water is something that is used in commerce or susceptible to use in commerce. Everything kind of, not a pun intended, flows from those particular types of waters, so tributaries to those waters. And those, when we talk about waters and water bodies, and the court has brought up things like open waters, ordinary, um, <clears throat> there's ordinary presence of water. Th that means when we talk about waters and waters in the United States, we're talking about things that are actually water bodies, what people would think of. So that's why the court went into, went into the whole point of relatively permanent bodies of water, then ordinary parlance means rivers, streams, whatever. <clears throat> that's not a scientific answer, that's just kind of an understanding of what Congress was intending and what's actually covered in the, the definition of navigable waters, which is then further defined by waters in the United States. Um, on the, the, the state laws, um, one of the, I was in North Carolina when they passed um, a, a law dealing with, like, can't exceed the state, the federal standard. Look, one of the reasons why is because the federal standard was getting so, it was in the air context, was getting so insane that that's why they passed it. Now, I'm not sure I support state laws that do that, but my expectation is that because federal government has been so heavy handed in the, in the water context for so long, um, the states may not have decided to actually get as in, involved um, with protecting waters or going exceeding the federal standards. But now, things very well could change, and I think they will. Um, really so quickly, please, so again, for quick. the sake of time. But yeah. this is so, so this is an area where actually Darren and I have a fundamental disagreement. And I think the answer is, where do you find the answer? You look at the statute. And so if you're wondering, what does the Clean Water Act say it's about? It's about restricting pollution. And the Supreme Court in Sackett said, under Section 404, what should be the test for wetlands protection? Like, what's the criteria? The Clean Water Act actually helpfully states what it is. It's about prohibiting discharges with adverse effects on water supplies, shellfish beds, fishery areas, including spawning and breeding areas, wildlife or recreational areas. Um, and then there's other features that talk here about things that would cause degradation and impair envir the environment or human health or welfare, and so, and includes harms to plankton, fish, shellfish, wildlife. So if you're wondering what the statute is about, it, this is the express language of the statute. Any agency that tried to protect a wetland and could not show that it had some of these functions would lose. But that also, it, the opposite is true also. This is, the Supreme Court in Sackett did not quote any of this language, it ignored it. And so, and, and that's, what, that's where some of the disagreements lie, is that they, they just acted, and the statute also says, protect the integrity of waters. And so there, there is more of a statutory answer that, Cong that the Supreme Court neglected. Please. Thank you all. Good questions. Um, Want to continue the conversation on the implications of the case, the imp implications associated with this decision. So to start, what has the response been from environmental advocacy groups, the general public, industry, stakeholders of all sorts um, regarding the decision? Well, I'll make this really short. Um, environmental advocacy groups don't like the opinion. Um, industrial, well, industry groups, um, they like the opinion, but they want some clarity from the agencies as to how they're gonna implement the opinion. And <clears throat> there's more than just industry and environmental groups. It's uh, like farmers and just regular property owners, I think that they're, again, like the opinion, but it, it just depends. Um, and Professor Busby's talked about other groups, like hunting groups and others that may not be happy with the opinion. Yeah, I, I, I think environmental groups viewed this as one of the biggest losses for the environment of any modern decision by the Supreme Court. Um, uh, you know, what will happen with it I think this, like I mentioned, that there's this big issue that one curious aspect of the federal law is if someone previously was discharging pollutants or do, engaging in fill, um, if they complied with the obligations of their permits, they were shielded from any liability or obligations under other statutes, 
okay? So, so you had a thing called the permit shield. So businesses that were used to this, they get their permit, then they knew they were safe. Now they've lost their permit shield. So what I've heard is happening around the country is where industry in certain cases saying, what do we have to do? One thing they've just lost is they've lost their permit shield. So now they have to, either they can be sued for it or other statutes kick in. And this big issue about the Solid Waste Disposal Act, known as RICRA because of an amendment, um, it appears it's triggered now. So a lot of industrial dischargers now will probably be subject to much more onerous and difficult regulation under RICRA. And so this is, um, again, I, I'm not sure that the majority opinion was aware of this effect, but it is a problem. And so we'll see. Have there already been changes to agency actions, particularly at EPA, as a result of the decision? Yeah, so let me start with the fact that the Biden administration proposed a new BOTUS rule, definition of waters in the United States, um, and that was before the Supreme Court decided to take the Sackett opinion, it's the Sackett case. And then the Supreme Court decided to take the Sackett case. And instead of waiting for the Supreme Court to issue its opinion in some time this year and earlier this year, the Biden administration decided to finalize its rule in January of 2023 for reasons I have no idea why. I think it's irresponsible. They knew, everybody knew that significant aspects of the opinion were gonna strike down major port, would make many aspects of the Biden rule moot, and that's exactly what happened. Um, unanimously, you, the court unanimously struck down the significant nexus part I was talking about. So what the, what the agencies have done is they've issued what is what they call WOTUS amendments. Basically, they're amending the final rule, um, and in, basically it's like going into the rule and doing like track changes. And they didn't really, that's not sufficient, and they also didn't take public comment on it as well. Um, so they've taken action. They'll fill in the gaps, presumably through guidance, but really the answers to a lot of these questions need to be done through a rule, not through guidance. Yeah, I mean, so what this, this it was a brief rule, this corrective rule, and what the, the administration decided to do was really very largely just take chunks of language from the SACA case and say, Whatever we said before, it's this, and in a few cases they said, we no longer are gonna to try to protect certain waters. So they, I think in part because the case is not a very fully reasoned case, they just took the bottom line language from the Sackett opinion, and in this new directly issued final rule, said, okay, so this is what's required. So it kind of superimposed it. So as you said, I think there'll be further clarity about how it all fills, you know, fits together but I think because they largely quoted the Supreme Court, I think they probably correctly insulated themselves from the challenge because it's hard for someone to say, you know, you can't do what the Supreme Court said to do. So they've, it's mostly mimicking um, or co directly quoting the Supreme Court. I have two fairly broad questions, but I'm sure we'll have great answers to both. Um, I'm just gonna ask them in conjunction before we kind of start to wrap up um, based on the time. So what legislative or policy changes could arise in response to the Sackett decision? And then how might this shape future discussions on environmental regulation and proper, property rights, excuse me, in that relationship? Feel free. Do you want me to go, you want to go first? Um, so um, I think right now with legislative gridlock um, and, and partisan um, divisions on the, on the Hill, the, the era where environmental laws were passed with unanimous bipartisan votes, which is all the environmental laws were of that sort, that is no longer the case. So I don't think we're gonna see any amendment of the Clean Water Act in a protective direction, uh, at least in the foreseeable future. I'm not sure anyone does. So which means a lot of the actions could be at the state level. So a lot of states have laws that either were trying to take over federal law, their own laws, and so th what they decide to do is a big issue, because they could previously point at the, you know, the bad actor if they didn't like it, now ah, the federal government's making us do it, but the reality is wetlands and, and rivers, including dry water features for some of the year, are really important. If you're in a water scarce state, 
water resources are more valuable than anything else, right? What did Mark Twain say? Water's, uh, whiskey, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting, I think was he said, in the, in the Western dry states. And, uh, and so it'd be a big issue what states decide to do. Will they step up or not? If it's just partisan you know, politics, Republicans, Democrats, they won't go in the, in the protective direction. But this is now a choice. I mean, I think you know, waters matter. Waters are big business, and waters matter to farms. Cities have to have clean waters. And so more polluted waters are something that there's a lot of reasons not to want. So we'll see. So let me bit off the state thing, and I'll get to the federal. Because <clears throat> um, it just kind of hit me that I think states will act, but I do think it's going to be important for the EPA and Corps to clarify <clears throat> what the how the rule works and how they're implementing SACIT. So I'll get a better idea of actually what the scope of the, the opinion actually is, at least according to EPA and CORE. Right now it's very hard. Like it's, it's hard to know what the EPA, the agencies mean by relatively permanent waters. What do they think that means? Do they think that covers what are intermittent waters, ephemeral waters, just the, so those are things that have to be clarified and I know a lot of people are trying to figure out. Um, so that might delay states on that, but I agree that states will eventually take action, and I think that makes sense. Um, on the federal level, the House, a um, decent number of Democrats introduced legislation a few days ago called the Clean Water Act of 2023. I haven't analyzed it, um, but that's some legislation. I don't think it'll go anywhere, of course, but that's been introduced. There's language that existed even before Sackett called the Define Otis Act of 2023, which I think is very good legislation. Um, and, uh, th but that's not gonna go anywhere. <clears throat> I think what realistically needs to happen and what will happen is Congress will engage in a lot of oversight to make sure the agencies are doing what they're supposed to do and make sure that the rules are consistent with Sackett opinion. I'm going to start to wrap up. Um, I want to end, well, we're going to ask audience, audience questions once again. Um, but I would love if there are any takeaways that you have from the case or topic areas, aspects of this that you haven't gotten to speak to yet. I think I would love to hear your concluding thoughts. Well, I guess I'd say two big things. So one is environmentally, uh, the point I made earlier, which is people may celebrate a shrinkage of burdens on property, but most features that we depend on in the natural environment are harmed by many small actions. So that's just a reality, and it makes it a difficult and interesting problem. Uh, I think it's a very harmful decision. The one thing we didn't talk about much is, um, is there's a whole body of law called statutory interpretation law, and there's normal ways in which statutes are interpreted, um, and one of the quirks of the majority opinion in Sackett is uh, it violates many of the ordinary tenets of statutory interpretation that, frankly, Justice Scalia made his life. It was the project of Justice Scalia's life was to have a more orderly text respecting body of law about how statutes should be interpreted. Uh, and that the fundamental there, again, is legislative supremacy. Congress makes the fundamental policy choices. And so it's not the discussion for tonight, or not more fully, but uh, for those who are interested in law and how language and power are related, you know, there is a big issue about, is this a sound decision in its method and its respect for Congress? And I would say, unfortunately, it's very disrespectful and violates some fundamental tenets that most people think statutory interpretation should do. I think a couple of things. One, again, Despite, I think, media accounts, this was a unanimous decision as to the outcome, not the reasoning. Um, so the sackets were, property wasn't regulated, wetlands, according to the Supreme Court. So I think it's important to bear in mind. Um, sometimes when you see the media accounts, you don't get that sense from it. Um, beyond the law, I think there's a, a disc. There are folks that believe that the federal government, in order to have environmental protection, the federal government has to play a very significant role in a federal regulatory role. <clears throat> and I just disagree with that. 
that there are states, there's local governments, there's federal government that doesn't have to actually even be involved in the regulatory space. They can do things through spending, as we've seen um, recently with this Congress. We've been more than happy to use spending to get into environmental issues, um, as we saw with the IRA. Uh, and the, the other final point is everybody wants clean water, but there are trade-offs. And we can't forget these trade-offs. And I think that too often, trade-offs trade -offs like higher prices or restrictions on property rights or restrictions on individual freedoms um, are sometimes not respected enough and ignored. And I think that we can respect the environment, have a clean environment, while still respecting these important principles. Thank you both. Thank you. Feel free to clap, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you both being here, and I do just Thanks. wanna open it up. We probably have time for one to two audience questions if there are any, so. Hey, thank you both for uh, being here tonight. Um, I had two questions for you, if that's okay. The first one is, are there cases already sort of around the corner trying to test the limits of this? of the Sackett decision and like duke out some of the details we mentioned about like ephemeral waters and other things um, or test the limits of like, can they go further to like uh, weaken uh, what is, uh, the CWA? And my second question was, is there any kind of precedent or sort of changes in like rulemaking or legal thinking uh, around balancing broader environmental climate change centered concerns and concert versus concert more narrow conservation concerns so like maybe not in the Sackett case but theoretically right a clean energy developer or whatever is trying to build on what on something that could theoretically be caught up in like the wetlands or in some other sort of environmental law mm -hmm. issue regulatory issue is there any kind of movement to like balance like well yes this might be bad for this like narrow piece of land or some narrow conservation concern or uh, under the Endangered Species Act or anything, but it might be worth it because we have these other sort of broader climate concerns. Let me just answer the, the first part. Um, the litigation is so complicated about what's going on, um, but I don't think there's going to be any effort to do anything more than <clears throat> try to clarify. Um, in this case, make sure that it's enforced properly. I think for the most part, this opinion for at least folks, on, at least on one side, you, you said to I don't like to think of it as weaken. This, if you're not technically weakening a statute, you might be weakening how it's been interpreted. Um, but at least on the folks that are kind of the property rights side of things, I think the idea is that this is a very good opinion. It was consistent with the plurality opinion in that Rapanos case. And if I think if applied properly, it will achieve what's needed to provide clarity for property owners and also protect the environment and also respect state rights, property rights, et cetera. So I think we just need to see how it plays out. Um, and I'll leave you on the second part of it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm not aware of any other, I mean, cases that are sort of parts of campaigns to ach achieve regulatory reform or weakening are, are kind of like civil rights battles and decades ago that is, they're very pushed in a concerted way. And the Sacketts were represented by what are called impact litigators. They were trying to represent the Sacketts and impact the law. I'm not aware of any current cases that are the next, you know, the next version. Uh, it, the victory was a pretty strong victory um, for the, uh, those who were hoping to weaken uh, the, the extent of things protected as federal waters. I, on your second question, I wasn't fully as I if I let me try to restate it. Tell me if I understand that you're wondering whether across different statutory protections, if there's some way to take into account the overall benefits of something, uh, so it can happen if it's going to be creating some important net environmental benefit. Yeah. Um, the, the short answer is some laws do that. So part of the Clean Air Act and some permitting has a a provision that calls for some overall assessment of costs and benefits um, of particular permitting decisions. There are also various carve-outs from already uh, certain kind of uh, filling and building in waters for things like pipelines and electric lines and the rest that, that 
just because you need to have networks and connections. So you already have that law. There are battles going on now about whether there should be further permitting reform that would streamline permitting, because some later law might be able to come in and streamline things that would affect multiple laws. And so we'll see what would happen there. But the bottom line is, that said, most statutes are each their own world and you look at the issues. So if there's endangered species, that body of law is triggered. You know, if it's air pollution issues, there's that body of law. If you're filling or dumping pollution in what seems to be water, that's a different body. So it's a little bit siloed. The law doesn't generally do very well in sort of mixing the effects of all laws. Does that sound right? Yeah, sounds right. Just wanted to say thank you on behalf of both ACC and Fed Society. I think if there's any lingering questions, perhaps they'll be willing to stick around, take them for a couple minutes, but just wanted to thank you both again. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you all thank very you. much. Thank you.